Okay, should we get started? All right. Uh, let's go. Top. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the first ever Petro Plaza webinar. We've partnered up with uh, Hedge Patrol as they focus on real time data visibility and provide insights on margins that retailers have never seen before. Uh, with me are Nick Patel and Mark Truman. Thank you very much for organizing this. It was actually their initiative, so um, big thanks from Petro Plaza for this. If it works out, we'll, we'll continue doing these, uh, these webinars. Today we'll be focusing on data and fuel pricing. It's one of the major topics in today's industry. It is definitely the biggest lever that most of our readers and retailers have to improve their profits. So let's just start off with a few general questions. Uh, Mark, just to give a bit of a uh, context to everything. So Mark, how much of a game changer is in today's market to have precise and accurate fuel pricing? Um, in all honesty, it's probably not a game changer because everybody's been setting a pole sign price since any market was liberalized. Um, so if you're in an open market, you're always trying to better the competition in some way, whether that's on margin or it's on volume. Um, I would say that it's um, you know, very much based on your portfolio, uh, the objectives of your business, how you would want to set that pricing strategy and how much of a game changer it can be for you. Um, mm -hmm. it, it very much is also about the size of your portfolio. And we'll touch on, on some of those things a bit later in the presentation about um, you know, what it is that drives how you should price your site um, and, and what else you can use to do that. Yeah. Uh, when, we're talking, when we're talking about pricing, you know, what's the key data that retailers use to set those prices up? And is there an adequate fuel price that they can, they can have? Yeah, so one, one of um, our partners um, who used to run a rather large portfolio, I, I don't want to betray any confidences here, but they tell me that they, they used to run a large number of, of stations. And they tell me that in, in 15 years running a large portfolio of fuel, they probably hit the sweet spot twice right, across their stations. Um, so, you know, is there, uh, what is it that, that every retailer is kind of looking at or what they can use to kind of drive that, that pricing is, what's on the screen here actually in our, on our first slide is, is very much around volume, margin and profit um, and certainly competitors. So in an ideal world, we'd all set a high margin, we'd all make, you know, lots of money from that and we wouldn't have to worry about volume, but competition lowers um, the ability to just drive volume to your site without a pricing strategy. So it all seems quite obvious, but um, this means that different retailers have different pricing strategies and sit at different parts of the market. Mm -hmm. um, and from our experience, when, when we started Edge Petrol, we were very much talking to retailers who were telling us, well, every day I'm looking at where are my volumes, where are my competition at, where are my cost prices, what margin do I desire, and what price do I need to set to achieve my objectives before the end of the month? So. They're trying to balance these things, hence the scales. Um, they're trying to balance between those key data points in order to hit a sweet spot, which is almost unobtainable. Um, so it's a bit of a conundrum, and that's, that's why we've used that terminology. And I think that's one of the reasons that um, there are some good tools that do exist in the market to try and help them solve that, that problem or, or even uh, react to that opportunity. Yeah. Uh, talking about those tools, obviously there's been a great te technological development over the years. Uh, I think, Nico, you're going to give us a little uh, presentation on how that's developed over the years. Yeah, um, I thought it'd be a good idea to talk about how we got to where we are now. Right? And I wasn't around for, for this time, and it seems like eons ago, but, but there's a certain, or there was a certain beauty in, in writing down um, things on a piece of paper with a pen, right? Um, previously, retailers used to write down their cost prices, volume numbers, as well as margin numbers, physically. Right? It's, um, very it's very common nowadays that we see this in single site operators. But in, in 78, um, next slide please, uh, there was a chap that came uh, along by the name of Dan Bricklin, and he created what was effectively the first iteration of the modern day spreadsheet. I think yeah, we're having some technical issues. Um, I can see the slides on my side. Hey, me too. The participants. Not sure I'll be able to see it. Let's 
Uh, maybe they can let us know in the chat if uh, you're all having some technical technical issues and you can't see the slides. Yeah, Richard Hammond has raised hand. It is. Oh, we've got some chat. They can see now. They can see yeah. the slides. Yeah. See the slides. Thank okay, you, Mark. Awesome. Thanks, guys, for um, for writing that yeah. down. Great, great response. So we're expecting lots of good questions later. That's a responsive <laughs> audience. Um, okay, All right. great. Yeah. So, so where was that? In '78, there was a guy called uh, Dan Bricklin who created what was effectively the first iteration of the modern day spreadsheet. Now, uh, only up until about ten years after that was when fuel retailers started to adopt what we now know as Excel into their daily operations. Now. Listen, everybody on the call has used Excel. Um, it provides a lot of capabilities, but there's also um, some limitations to it. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of room for human error, um, as well as um, the information found on an Excel spreadsheet is often after the fact. Um, I think if I were to ask any one of the attendees, what was your worst memory in the office? A lot of you guys would probably um, recall a time where Excel did something that it shouldn't have done based on human error. Um, before Christmas, I was spending, I spent about four hours creating a spreadsheet for Mark, who's on the call. Um, Excel crashed, and I and I had to spend that four hours um, doing it all again. Which is why we now use Google Sheets, right, Nick? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Um, then came the 90s, right? And a company uh, called Calibrate entered the market, which was effectively, Mark, can you switch the slide? Um, which effectively was the um, first fuel pricing offering in the, the market, right? They gave us really the first glance into what is now becoming reality, artificial intelligence. And the offering uh, might so sound quite simple now, but um, effectively it was rules-based pricing by understanding uh, the local competitive landscape, right? Businesses could now effectively set rules against their business objectives, which they couldn't do before. Um, then we enter the 2000s, right? So next slide. Um, and we had uh, companies, so, well, um, Price Advantage entered into the market with a partnership with Skyline Science. And this was a really cool development um, for a number of reasons. But fuel retailers were now, um, if they had the right hardware or acquired the right hardware, able to set their call sign price remotely at any time, at any site, um, you know, um, wherever they were. Um, there, was another, there was another massive paradigm shift um, in, in the market and in everyday life, actually, and that was a smartphone. So what the smartphone allowed us to do was to have apps. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you remember the smart first app you had on your phone. Mine, mine wasn't Gas Buddy. Um, but crowdsourced pricing applications have now popped up. Um, but there are limitations to those as well, and they still haven't replaced the traditional methods that we see in the industry um, uh, because of a number of reasons. Right? They um, tend to be localized and the geographic coverage might not be what the specific retailer requires. Um, and the information on these apps is sometimes um, subject to manipulation. Um, we skip over a couple of years and we hit the 2010s and this is where it starts to get uh, even more exciting. A2I entered the market and they successfully implemented an algorithm based on consumer habits, um, which um, we hadn't seen in the market before. Um, anybody listening from a market like um, Germany or Denmark? I think we've had a little issue with the sound. Oops. Yeah, can you guys hear me better now? No, yeah. 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 So as I was saying, um, uh, anyone listening uh, on the call from Denmark or Germany, you guys will, uh, will know that your markets are highly volatile um, and you require a lot of uh, price changes during the day. A2I uh, came into the market and created an offering that was fit for purpose uh, and they've done quite well. And in 2017, we launched Edge Petrol. Now, our focus is more on data visibility and giving a retailer accurate information to critical insight. Right? We connect to every single part of the uh, petrol station's infrastructure to give you a real-time um, moving cost price uh, for you to make better pricing decisions compared to the traditional methods like using the replacement cost. Um, so where are we now? Right? We've got a number of tools. Um, so how do you choose? How do you as a retailer choose the right tool and why would you choose that, um, that specific um, tool or product? 
We'll dive into this in a couple of moments, but I think Mark wanted to give you a couple of um, examples as to what's currently going on uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just, just before we move on, on this particular slide. Um, so one of the companies that we actually haven't mentioned throughout is, is PDI. Um, so PDI are a, um, a very valuable business in terms of they offer a fuel suite of products, um, not just on fuel pricing. Uh, I think they acquired uh, IIS, uh, which is actually a British company. So us Brits seem to be very in the pricing game um, through Calibre, ourselves, um, and PDI. Um, and the, um, the PDI themselves aren't British, but they've made maybe 15, 20 acquisitions over the last few years to bring a suite of kind of data products and software products to the market. So they're, they're someone who we didn't mention throughout. Um, you can see them on the far left there, but they, they, were, they are also offering kind of a pricing solution which would compete um, in, in this space as well. Uh -huh. um, so I, I'm going to just switch topics slightly um, and talk about some of the ways that data is being used um, both for pricing and, and for bringing companies to um, to your sites, right? So, um, not that many people in the call will actually recognise this brand. So this this is actually a Dutch brand called Tank U. Um, anyone who attends kind of events in Europe will probably have met um, a guy called Jan Harman, who is uh, the uh, CEO of this business. And Tank U positions itself as a technology company um, that happens to own fuel assets. And it's when you when you start talking to them or hearing them talk, it's it's a very interesting concept. So whether it's by a loyalty card, via facial recognition, number plate recognition, um, you're able to go to this site and you will have designed loyalty for you specifically, right? So in, in the case of Tank U, they're actually, you know, if you're a regular customer or you haven't been for a while or whatever it might be, they're actually setting a price based on the individual customer. Right, so we're moving. This is kind of what I would consider to be into the future. I think they're well ahead of the curve with this, and I don't think it's something which we're going to see um, across a lot of stations um, soon. They only have, I think, 35 or 40 stations somewhere in that remit, but they're trying to bring that kind of mobility picture into one place. They're offering uh, car rentals, discounts on kind of other uh, forms of transportation. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's interesting to know that the technology exists now to be able to actually price by individual customer. So those pricing strategies, you know, are, are now moving into this, you know, we've had algorithm based, you know, per station, we're moving into algorithm based per customer. Um, it's something that, that's quite new to the market. So, uh, Mark, before you move on to the next example, um, you know, the Dutch are very known for their innovation. So it's, this is a really good example. Um, but do you think that um, with such a use of, of data, do you think there could be any kind of backlash from the consumer? You know, if, if they go, they pay for the fuel and the car behind them is a friend and they just paid a few cents less because they had a different uh, individual offering. Or do you think the customer will just kind of gradually um, get into the notion of, of this new use of data? It's a huge question because if, very, if you take the UK, we are very sensitive souls when it comes to pricing, right? Uh, as in the consumers. Not as much as Germany, um, places where it's highly volatile, right? Uh, I think there's 15 price changes a day in Germany. Everyone checks an app, and by the time they go and actually fill up from that app, it's probably cheaper somewhere else, right? Um, so I think it's, it's cultural, first of all. It's how long that market has been liberalized, whether that market is volatile or not. Um, I know we've got, I think Calibre are actually on uh, listening in and I know they talk a lot about uh, what volatile market, you know, the difference between, you know, through uh, regulated to uh, liberalized to volatile and how that process happens. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's one part. But the other bit is if you think about this is kind of a positive way of doing it, right? This is where you're actually receiving um, a price based on your loyalty. There is a flip side to this, that if you could put this technology in and I could turn up and I drive Mercedes Benz and my data tells me that my Mercedes, you know, Mercedes Benz drivers are happy to pay more for fuel or they don't care as much about how much they pay for fuel, that might end up with me having a higher price. Um, so whether we can actually get to a point where, the, where this is actually a properly commoditized industry and, and, and you pay based on your demand, maybe, or your ability to pay, um, it, it's it kind of... You know, I wouldn't know how, how to, to expect a consumer response to that, but it's, it's definitely an interesting, um, I, 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 would, I would think that in the UK, we, everyone is so reluctant to move the pole sign price 
more than once a day because of high fuel duties. And I, I, you know, something like this might, might, yeah, it might cause a problem. Yeah, um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see uh, how, how they get on. I think A2I had, had a, a little bit of a, a, an issue in the UK where I think their product was slightly misunderstood. Maybe was, I saw an article about it. Um, yeah, some markets, yeah, and, and other markets, no, I think is the answer. All right, we can move into the next example. Yeah. Um, yeah, so Pet Petrol Plaza, um, you know, ran an article last week on how actually um, Exxon Mobil are actually allowing customers to pay via their car, so via Alexa. If their car has Alexa, they can say, right, pay for fuel, fill me up to 40 litres or whatever it might be. And um, the reason I, I brought this in is this is, again, using data to actually provide a better consumer experience. So yes, your pricing is vital. Yes, your pricing is important. But by having a more well-rounded offering, um, it actually sometimes, you know, the reason people go and pay for bigger brands um, is because they are offering a better service all round. And I think that's ExxonMobil's thinking here. Around across 11,500 stations, they want to be able to, to make this a seamless experience for their customers. Uh, um, so I thought that, that was worth mentioning. Mm -hmm. Plus, it was a Petrol Plaza article, so I couldn't resist. Thank you, thank you for the plug, Mark. It is a very, good, it is a very interesting example, and we're going to see a lot of developments around uh, this sector in the in the next five years. Uh, it's going to be a completely different industry when it comes to payment and the use of big data for any kind of service. Yeah, I mean mo mobile apps as well. Um, yeah, I think I think they only account for you know maybe one percent or less than one percent of sales at the moment in the UK, but there is a real shift in in how you know, not just how consumers want to pay for fuel, but what's available to them in terms of options um, to be able to do that. I, I don't know if you've, uh, across Europe, you have this, but there's actually a company in the UK now, um, Zebra Fuels, who will come up and, and to your driveway and actually fill up for you, right, while you're in your house. Um, all, again, all done by app and all done in, in quite a smart way. Um, they don't do that with, with uh, Unleaded um, because Unleaded explodes. But um, they, uh, they're definitely offering that in, uh, in diesel. Yeah, we've seen, uh, I've seen a number of startups uh, regarding that uh, feeling at home with apps in Canada and the States. So that's definitely something that retailers should watch out for or get into that business as well. Yeah, one, one of our, actually one of our um, fuel, like as in our, one of our partners in America who is actually a retailer, they actually offer that service. So yeah, it is, it is touching all, all areas. And then this is, this is something that I think us and, and a few of our kind of um, peers in, in the competitive pricing industry have always, conundrum we've always tried to crack, right? What is my site sensitivity? Now, for the retailers that are on, on the webinar, you will have a good understanding of what happens to your site when you put the price up or down versus the competition, right? That's part of the art of fuel pricing that goes along with the data and along with the science, right? So you're using data to make a better decision about your station. So you, we're, we're already looking at sensitivity just by looking at our competitors and looking at our volumes, right? That, that makes it quite simple. Um, this is an example that Edge Petrol have been working on uh, with an unnamed customer that has several hundred stations. Uh, we looked at five years worth of fuel data um, and we actually took um, the competitor prices alongside that and their pulse line prices. And we were able to map out what the elasticity of, of their stations were. And what you can see here is on the left, you kind of got this, this small light greeny cluster um, that if you were to move those stations um, up one penny across a year, quite, quite placid, but just an example, um, you would make millions of pounds extra money, right? And then if you were to then take with losing minimal volume, right? If you were to take the right hand side, these kind of um, the, the kind of more spread out um, dots that you see on the right, uh, the blue, light blue ones, um, and you were to put them down a penny, you would actually increase volumes by between 15 and 20% on those stations. So why is this such a good graph to look at? Because if you're managing a portfolio and you're not, you know, see, if you've got one station, it's still important to understand your site sensitivity. But if you've got lots of stations and you're able to actually pull that lever to say, right, well, I'm going to lose volume here and increase my, my profits. And over here, I'm going to lose, I'm going to lose a bit of margin to increase my volume as a portfolio. You're going to make a lot more money. So it's, it's having that understanding across the board of where your sites sit in that, in that matrix and, and how you can use them to increase profitability. Mm -hmm. that's, that's really interesting, uh, Mark. So I think from uh, Hedge Patrol, you've come up with four types of uh, retailers or stereotypes when it comes to fuel pricing uh, that can help us kind of, you know, just make things a bit more clear. 
Stereotypes is, is probably the right word, yeah. yeah. Uh, right. With, uh, well, I'll pass you over to Nicole for this one. Yeah, so you're bang on the mark, Oscar. Um, uh, over the last three years, we've spoken to hundreds uh, of retailers of all shapes and sizes. Um, and we've narrowed down into four categories, if you like. Um, the first being Libero, right? So the Libero's main goal is to sweep up all of the volume that they can. Um, undercutting their competition if they have to uh, by having the most competitive price. Now, in terms of what data a Libero looks at, the only thing that they really need to look at or do look at is the competitor prices in that uh, area. Right? Even though they have a wealth of information at hand, that's really all they care about. Because if they know that competitor X is moving, they'll have to either match that very quickly or go even further below um, to increase volume through their site and then subsequently uh, increase um, footfall. Um, Mark, you've been here for a while. Can you think of any examples in the UK market or, or anywhere else that, that would fit into the Libero category? Yeah, I think uh, the, the best example would be Asda, probably in the UK, um, who are, you know, they, I, I guess they kind of compete that out a little bit with Sainsbury's and, and, and Morrison's and Tesco's to some extent. Um, but the, in the UK market, they make up around, those four companies make up around 40% of the fuel volume over here. So, um, you know, they, they didn't even, they weren't even in fuel kind of 25 years ago, right? They, they went, came in, built big stores and big sites uh, next to them, um, and they've swept up 40% of the market. And we've actually gone from 15,000 stations down to around eight and a half thousand. I'm not, I'm not totally laying that at the feet of the, uh, the, the supermarkets, but it's, um, you know, that that is kind of their pricing strategy to make sure they are, you know, priced at a few pennies under the independence. Yep. On, a, on another note, in terms of another market, um, we were in America a couple of weeks back and we were speaking to small to, to medium sized retailers. And, and some of the, the, the main issues that they had with the liberos in their markets was that in some states in America, you can sell below cost. So imagine you're sat next to a libero um, and they're allowed to do that. You need to think about, how can you counteract that? So the next category um, is my personal favorite uh, because of my Swedish connection, and it's a Slatan. So the Slatan only cares about one thing, and it's margin, right? So they're happy to sacrifice um, volume, uh, and the only thing that they pro make their pricing decisions against are um, cost prices. Right, so the, the Slatan will typically have quite a lot of uh, volume fluctuations, but when they score, they, they score really big. So when the price is attractive, they're going to make a lot of money. Mark, any, any examples on, on that one? Um, without giving too much away, um, yeah, uh, I think there's, there's a, I would go for the kind of the highway sites, right? Um, I, I probably is the same in Europe. I mean, I, I, I be interested if, if anyone on the call would be able to fill me in, but it's certainly in the UK. Uh, if I think my local BP is priced around 129.9, um, and I went to uh, fill up uh, on the motorway a couple of weeks ago and it was priced at 149.9, right? So they're taking an extra kind of 20 pennies margin per litre. Um, mm -hmm. So I would say that they're probably not pricing based on um, the competition or their volume. They're, I mean, I'm sure they look at it, but it's, it's very much. Uh, you know, what is my cost price and, and how can I price above that to make sure I'm achieving the, the, the desired profit per litre rather than across my portfolio. Okay, so, so the next one is uh, the Groundhog. Um, and if you switch over uh, to the next slide. So, so the Groundhog uh, is, is focused on stability, right? The, the mantra for them is the market will always move up and down in increments. Um, but at the end of the day, they were, the market will always meet in the middle. Um, so they'll only ever really change their price if they feel that the market has moved drastically. Um, and they do this because, you know, brand perception is key, right? They, they look at uh, their local area. They're typically small, um, but busy retailers. And a lot of the people that we've been speaking to see themselves, the groundhogs, this is, see themselves as shopkeepers that, that sell fuel, not necessarily uh, the other way around. Um, don't necessarily have to go into specific examples because I think that would betray the trust of a number of our clients. But I Mark, think, any thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I think if you're looking at this type of, of retailer, uh, they, they're very they're sporadic. Um, you know, I think they're typically small in nature. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of your kind of single site or maybe a, a handful of sites in, in an area whereby, 
you know, it's a little bit sleepy. There's not too much competition. Um, this is not necessarily a bad system. In some markets, this is extremely justified, right? If, uh, you know, if everyone's sitting on a similar price, uh, whether that's because you're offering uh, a good price to the consumer or you're sitting on margin, um, that's this, you know, it, it can work for, for different types of stations. And, and finally, we have the enganche, which um, is if the, the enganche is effectively looking to make things happen across their entire portfolio, right? So they might be happy to lose volume on, on one site because while they're losing volume on one site, they're looking at all of their other stations to see where they might be able to make up in margin. Um, you know, the, the, this model is typically um, used by growing businesses or, or larger portfolios. Again, spotting opportunities um, at the right time is key for, for the enganche. Now, the risks of this is if you have inaccurate data, um, you're not going to be able to spot those opportunities. Um, and if you can't action um, any fluctuations in the market, you're going to lose out um, overall. Um, one of the key benefits to this, I'd say, is it, once you've um, nailed down the process, um, it's a lot easier to run a, a growing business in, in this way. Mark, any notes on this? Yeah, so I think we, if, if you're looking at this particular type, I, all four of these, I'll flip onto the next slide, all, all four of these types need data in some way, shape or form. Um, your groundhog probably needs the least. Um, your enganche probably needs the most. Uh, but if you look for, for the libero, it's the speed of that data, that competitor data. Um, for the Zlatan, it's the accuracy of the cost prices to make sure that, that the margin is being maintained. And for the enganche, it's everything, right? Um, if you're running a large or growing portfolio or even a small one and you're trying to sweat those assets and maximize those profits, having access to both an automated tool that can help you set those prices data that is coming to you on the day in real time or whatever in whatever format that that is best for your business is very important right um you know you, you the, the more access to valuable insight that you have the better you will be able to um increase your profitability or for, for your stations um so we're actually going to run a poll i know that not everybody on the uh, webinar is is a retailer we've got a lot of partners and other people who are interested on um, so if you're not actually a retailer, you don't have to, uh, you don't have to um, state this, but um, you could ask yourself, what would you be if you're a retailer? I'm sure, I'm sure you'd want to say in Gunche. Be a little bit honest. We're going to launch the poll. Um, and that should be with you guys now. Which retailer are you or would you like to be? That's good. So Engante is in the lead now. Yeah. There's a few honest slat hands out there. That that's the best thing about Zlatan is he's he, he's uh, he's pretty honest about about it. Right. Um, so I'm not surprised that that people are admitting that. A few groundhogs. Okay. Give it another couple of seconds. We've got 40 people voting, which is great. So uh, Mark and, and Nickel, um, coming from the UK. One of the biggest players right now in the world who is making most of the noise is the Euro garages. You know, how, how would you fit them in these categories? And um, obviously well, they're kind of in Gantcha, right? So Euro garages are, yeah, I mean, they're, first of all, they're a different beast, right? I mean, they're huge, they're growing quickly, very heavily PE backed, right? I think they started with one station. Right. In Blackburn, right, I think? In Blackburn, they're based in Blackburn. Um, personally, I don't know them, um, so I'm, I'm, I would be going on, on a limb, but I don't think when you've got that variation of stations, a variation of markets specifically, so you have to be an enganche. You don't really have a choice, right? And I think what you would find with Euro Garage is they're probably picked up a load of different tools. I imagine, I, I know they don't, they don't have Edge Petrol, but I'm sure they have within some of the portfolios they bought, they have Calibrate, they have PDI, they might have price advantage knocking about somewhere, right? Um, I don't know is the answer, but I would be very surprised if all the estates they have bought weren't already using some kind of tool. The biggest challenge for Euro garages is how do they centralize that pricing? They'll never max, maximize that profitability across global, um, across their global portfolio until they in some way, shape or form centralize that, whether that's by country, whether it's by on a global scale. Um, so I, I don't think 
you know, a typical retailer doesn't face that challenge, right? Um, but uh, certainly if your pricing is not centralized, um, you know, that, that is going to cost you uh, on the bottom line, right? Mm -hmm. uh, having that central strategy that feeds into the different markets. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've had our vote. Um, the results are in Ganche, 62%. Um, so that's the, the most popular, uh, which is great. Um, Groundhog, uh, 9%. Uh, Zlatan, 18%. And the Libero, 11%. So um, I think it's important here to note that, you know, out of all of the, the, the 45 participants that voted, 62% of people need lots of data and information and tools, right? Um, and I don't know what everybody is using, um, but it, it certainly, I'd be very surprised if uh, Enganche is still using kind of pen and paper, Excel spreadsheets, right? There's, there's probably some tool that they use to be able to perform in that way. Um, and certainly if they're not, I, I would highly recommend they get in touch with us or, or one of our peers, right? Um, so just what kind of, uh, what other things do you need to consider um, when you're uh, putting together a uh, pricing strategy? right um, and trying to understand which tool you should be using so certainly number of stations is one right um, if you've got a large portfolio you have a lot of uh, tools and, and um, capabilities which you can put together right so um, for example you know if you've got multiple sites the likes of calibrate price advantage um, edge petrol as well you know these these guys this will work for you right you know it's going to work in one way shape or form if you've got one station, it doesn't really make that much sense to, to put a calibrate or, or a price advantage on the site, right? When you're there every day. Um, Edge Petrol, because it focuses on the visibility, might actually work for one station, right? Um, if you've got 7,000 stations where Edge Petrol is right now, it, it probably isn't you know, the right time for you. So there's different um, products are right for different sizes of portfolio. But as a general rule of thumb, what you'll see here is that the more stations you have, it's not a linear process, the even more benefit you get from that data, right? And the reason is, is a really good example is in the, in the UK, the, the grocers, you know, if, if they are uh, having to, are being challenged on volume in, in one place, or even not in the grocer, anyone who's been challenged in volume in one place, if you've got a portfolio and you have visibility or the ability to actually act on that through one of these tools, you can bring down in the, your exception sites, the stations that you're not happy with, you can bring down the price to drive the volume and take that margin elsewhere where the volumes are good, where the volumes are strong, where your competitors are not as, as aggressive. So by combining the tools, by, by bringing elasticity and certainly bringing a retailer's logic and their, their brain into the, uh, into the equation, the data benefits of having multiple stations increase significantly uh, over, over the size. Next thing to consider is market landscape. Um, Calibrate get another mention here. They do some really good, I think they, they bought a company a few years back called MPSI. Um, they do some really good kind of market analysis data, um, historical market trends, strengths and weaknesses of, of each market. And I think they even have a, a plotting tool, right? So you can actually see what would it look like if my station was here? What volume could I expect? Which I think is, is a really neat, neat piece of kit. Um, you've got Edge Petrol, so when it comes to competitive prices, um, part of what Edge offer is if you're happy to share your live pole sign price, um, you will receive everybody else's, right? So it's part of the kind of the, the, the live data suite that we offer. And you can see there on the left, you've got, got two examples of that with the, the little gray edges next to the two competitors. Um, on the right hand side, you'll see Gas Buddy. So this is obviously a mobile app, um, and this is capturing ways, I think ways do this and a number of other apps do this as well as um, if you look at kind of like fuel cards, um, there's a company in the UK called Experian Catalyst. I know there's a couple of businesses in, in the Netherlands and in Europe that do this as well, where they're capturing the pulse line price via a card and they send that out to their customers the next day. So, you know, what is your market landscape? What is your competitive situation? Do you have a lot of competitors? Um, if you remember the elasticity slide, actually the more competitors you have, the less, the more elastic your site is, right? The more sensitive it is to changes. Um, do you have aggressive prices nearby, or are you in a high affluent area where actually the competition is the, the competition is very much slatans? If you're all slatans, you're all going to make a lot of money, right? So um, it's understanding those dynamics which is which is key before you set a pricing strategy. And Mark, just uh, one quick question uh, on that slide. It 
Do you think that as uh, retailers have more and more data and live data of their competitors around them, will they tend to have a bigger difference with, uh, with their competitors or will they tend to kind of like, you know, have a more similar approach? It's, it's a really good question because obviously we're, we're, when it comes to live price sharing, we're the first to do it in the UK. So I, I know it, it, it almost ex sort of exists in Germany, but it's almost a double-edged sword because the prices are changing so quickly, right? Um, so it's very difficult to keep up with what's happening. Um, I think when you get into the territory of actual live pricing, like you can see here, I think you end up with a change in dynamics of the market. So um, the data that goes out that's typically used by the larger companies in the UK is Experian Catalyst, right? Um, that's yesterday's data at best, and it's kind of a bit diesel heavy. But those prices come out, and then people are implementing their strategies. I want to sit two pennies above, and I want to achieve a margin of six pennies, for example, right? Um, and what that's giving um, the retailer is a, day, a day's kind of time to take the extra margin or, you know, to, to react. And they know that they'll move their price and then their competitor will find out their price the next day, right? And, and then they'll make a move. They've got a whole day until they see that change, right? Um, when you move into live pricing, you know, you will see quicker, faster following, um, probably yeah. less temptation to lead downwards, right? Um, because you know that your competitors are just going to see that and follow you. Um, but I wouldn't think that in a market like here, you'd see that become more dynamic as in multiple price changes. Um, I know in the States, uh, for example, everyone's still doing price surveys, right? Um, they've got gas buddy, which is a great resource, but they still just can't shake the habit of sending the station, the station manager out every day and doing a survey of the local area. So I think it, I think it's very, um, it's important to, to understand that as data does evolve, you're going to see a, a bit of a paradigm shift in how um, how retailers react to price changes. Yeah. So, yeah. So. And actually, that that work that people send out still to um, to look at the price of the competition ties in really well with the next uh, topic we want to discuss, which is with all these new tools and big data. Um, you know, what do we do with all those workers and all that knowledge and that insight they had to um, to offer to the strategy of the of the retailers? So kind of like how can we tie in that human knowledge with uh, these modern tools that are obviously very effective? Yeah, so I've got a slide on that here. Um, again, this is also something to consider when you're trying to choose a tool, right? Um, at the moment, so first of all, any admin that your staff are doing that can be replaced with automation will increase the ROI data, they, they will increase the ROI of that staff member, right? Um, Number crunching is a monotonous and low return job, um, especially when a piece of software could do it. And remember, if you're using Excel, you're already using software. That is a piece of software, right? Um, but it's, it's got its limitations and restrictions because you have to input the data, right? Or most of the time you do. Um, so thinking about what else you can get your staff to be doing instead of that monotonous work is, is number one. Um, but the thing that you're talking about, Oscar, is this knowledge risk, right? Um, this this is, comes up a lot for us. And when you look at like bigger businesses, what you realize is that across hundreds of stations, the knowledge of how to run those, those portfolios sits in the heads of, of just one or two people, right? Um, maybe three or four if you're lucky. And should one of them leave or, or anything happen to one of those people, that system, that knowledge and that way to respond to uh, different situations leaves with them, right? And that's a huge risk. It's a huge human risk. Um, so by being able to store that information in a tool, right, being able to react quickly, have data at your fingertips, that, that type of um, infrastructure is very helpful to reduce the risk of loss of knowledge for your business. Um, the next thing on the list is, is another really interesting. So a lot of our customers talk to us about legacy planning, right? We've actually had people tell us, I'm buying Edge Petrol because I'm planning for my company's future, right? And they are... 30, 40, even more in some cases, years experienced, right? Um, and they're almost buying this for their family businesses and they're buying this for their, um, you know, their son or daughter who's taking over the business and, 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 you know, going to be running that. But they've only got two or three or four or five years experience in fuel. So planning for, for that, making sure, and, and that even works if you're looking to sell that business. We've had customers buy because they're looking to sell the business in two or three years and they want to increase their EBITDA. 
right? So um, just from, from our example, I know um, I've seen firsthand that A2I have factually made companies money. And from, from us as well, um, you know, it, it's, you know, just to give you one other example other than Edge, but for us, you know, some of our customers tell us that we're making them an extra penny a year, right? Um, that's uh, not just one penny, but a penny of margin per year, right? So that's, that's a considerable amount of money to, you know, and it's considerable change to EBITDA in an industry where you're getting between seven and 15 times, you know, as a multiple, right, on your station. So that's an interesting one. And, and finally, consolidation um, is really key because the markets across the world tend to be consolidating. Certainly we've seen it in the UK, we've seen it in the US, we see it on Petrol Plaza all the time, right? M&A um, is really active over the last few years. And as you consolidate, you will bring together multiple um, businesses. And the way, you know, we talked about Euro garages earlier, right? Okay, not everyone's in that situation, but they're going to have their own way of pricing those stations. They're, they're going to have their own methodologies by being able to say, look, this is how we do it. And we have a system in place, which helps us get the best out of our sites. Um, you're very, you're much, it's much easier to bring that into your portfolio, right? And, and make money out of that. Yeah. I think definitely as the, uh, as the industry continues to consolidate, uh, these tools will be a, a must for, for most of the players, especially as they're going to, you know, near territories, different territories, you definitely need a platform to kind of unite all that data that you have. Okay. So, I'm going to um, just finish on a, uh, a really exciting example from America. So uh, we've been out there talking to retailers over the last kind of three to four months. Um, and one of the things that was really clear to us, and this does exist in, in Europe as well, is that um, there are multiple profit centers around a, a forecourt, right? A forecourt brings footfall, it's gonna give you margin on fuel, excellent. Um, but fuel is just one revenue stream, right? So if your stations, what else are you offering? What else, are, you know, do you have valet? Do you have air serve? Do you have uh, a good shop, hot food, right? All of these things are, are, are available. And what we noticed a lot in, in the States and particularly with this one company, Bucky's, which is quite famous around the Texas area, because of the size of their stations, they actually own, I think, the largest or one of the largest stations in the world. Um, and the one I'm about to show you in this video is not even their biggest one. Um, but they, they actually have a, um, a system whereby if you have a car wash, you get 10 cents off, as an example, right? Uh, 10 cents on a gallon, not a litre, right? So it's, it's circa two and a half pennies off. So it's by bringing all of those different things together and understanding that somebody who comes to the station, what the conversion rate is from fuel to car wash or fuel to dry stock um, can make you give the right discounts uh, in order to, to uh, bring the right customer and get the right profits. And actually the brand in Bucky's case, the brand itself actually generates profits, right? So, you know, the size of these stations, and this is us just driving past and believe it or not, it then starts again. Uh, I think it's 128 pumps at this particular station. And it just goes on for it. This is in four times speed, this video. Um, and it, it just went on and on. You go inside the store, they're selling Bucky's merchandise. They've got cups, they've got t-shirts, they've got little beaver toys, right? And it's, it's a fun fair in there. Everyone's buying all this gear. Um, it's busy every single day. Um, look, they've got the real estate in Texas, you know, they've got the land to do it, but it's just an example of how you don't only need to look at data from your fuel to be able to maximize and, and sweat your asset. Um, so that, that's it from us. Unless Oscar, you got any more questions for me? Um, <clears throat> well, we've got uh, Gordon Barmer on the chat just a uh, question that I think um, maybe you could respond to which is that uh, basically one of the members um, recently asked if the um, transactional info includes VAT and does the value of fuel in the tanks also include VAT? And if both do, then you should take VAT off that number to see the net margin. Uh, I think this is an edge petrol specific question. Mm -hmm. um, regarding kind of the data. Now, Gordon, I, I know Gordon, I'll, uh, I'll pick it up with you afterwards. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. Okay. Uh, from, from me, I like to say, uh, you know, obviously we, we're seeing a huge surge in the use of data from the industry uh, from all kinds of players. And, um, 
you know, could, like, what's kind of like the impact that uh, players like Gaspari have had on the on the customer himself? You know, they've become more price aware just because it's got more access to to pricing. So kind of like, you know, just to get your thoughts on how that's affected the customer mind, which obviously affects the way retailers need to have the proposition. Sorry, can you repeat that? I didn't really catch the end of it. Oh, uh, just, uh, you know, what's the effect of uh, pricing apps like Gasbody giving the customer more information so the customer is even more price aware? And, you know, how does retailers, uh, how do they have to respond to that kind of uh, higher price awareness from the customer? Because it's just got so much information and available to them. Yeah, it's, it's I mean, it very much depends on the customer, right? I, I don't use apps like that. I think you've got a percentage in every market, you've got a percentage of people who are making their purchasing decision based on price. Mm -hmm. um, in the UK, it's actually fairly small, believe it or not. Um, in some markets like Germany, it's every single person will pretty much, well, according to the people I speak to in Germany, and someone might tell me I'm wrong here, but um, they're all looking at their phone and looking at the app to find the cheapest price before they go out and buy fuel, right? It's a highly sensitive market. So, and then within those, those kind of countries, you've got sub markets, right? So you've got affluent areas and non-affluent areas. We actually saw, um, I'll give you two really good examples. So, um, and this isn't necessarily to do with apps, but it's to do with, with Kind of lowering the price so one of our customers lowered their price at the weekend by a penny and they saw uh, versus the competition and they saw a 35 percent weekend uplift they also saw a 10 percent uplift during the week why because they'd won new customers who were coming back it's a low affluent area and what they, the, the customers were doing is they were putting 10 pounds in during the week right they're not thinking about the liters that they're, they're thinking in, in in the 10 pounds right so they were winning these new customers who were coming back in the week and making smaller fill-ups at a higher margin right that's just one good example um the other example is we have um another customer who was um who has been who who is actually in a much more aggressive and, and volatile market um, and they always sat as the lowest in that market and they've raised their prices. They've watched their prices go, their, their prices go up over time. And they've actually realized that their market is while everyone's pricing low, the actual consumer is actually not as sensitive to pricing as they thought. And they've watched their volumes stay relatively the same whilst their margin has gone up. Right. Um, and they tested it out and, and the, 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 it's a misconception in their market. Without the data, without being able to see, you know, and have the confidence in real time to see that those volumes weren't dropping, they might never have tried it. Now they sit two, three pennies above the competition, have the same sort of volumes. They're BP branded, so they've got a nice, you know, there's a brand element to what they're doing, um, and they're able to make more money, right? Um, so again, it's it's. I don't, I'm not sure that the consumers are as price sensitive as everyone thinks, but there are some markets you just can't get away with it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and definitely one of the uh, biggest trends right now in the industry is is, uh, is con the convenience sector, right? The drinks and, uh, and food segments of the business are getting bigger and bigger. So do you think as the convenience part of the, and you can see that in Ireland, there's a lot of retailers that, you know, have, have, most of their focus is actually on food and, and drinks. Do you think they'd be willing to set lower margins on fuel because they're making so much money inside the store? Yeah, so, I mean, look, you've got to look at your forecourt as a retail hub, right? Whether you're only selling fuel or whether you're selling multi, it's a retail hub. It's, it's a retail space that is selling retail goods to consumers, right? Whether it's commoditized goods or, or dry stock, it, it's still a retail good. So I think in terms of how you, how you map that up, I mean, we had one customer, not, not through Edge Petrol, they did this themselves, very rigorous process on yellow post-it notes in Excel, whereby they actually looked at unleaded or, or, or diesel, right? Which one spends more in my store? Which, what's the higher average basket spend? And which one is converting, right? And they found that diesel customers convert a lot more and spend twice as much money. Why, I can't tell you, right? I have no idea why. But that, that was what they found. So they put the unleaded price up and the diesel price down and the overall profitability of their store went right up, right? Um, another great example is one of the big trucker companies in the States was telling me that they, they get $30 margin out of one truck filling up, right? So whilst, you know, they want people in the shop buying food, actually, I'd rather take the margin on the fuel and I'll give them a pizza for free, 
right? So again, it's, it depends on, your, on, on how you're managing your portfolio and what's right for each station. Very much a station by station mapped up to a portfolio level view is, is what you're trying to take. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I do want to encourage everybody watching to uh, send out your questions. Um, you know, we have this Q&A space for another few minutes. Uh, I'd like to ask another question, which is, you know, so when we talk about data, um, you know, obviously governments are becoming more and more stricter when it comes to data uh, regulations. So, um, you know, do you think that will have an effect on the use of data from retailers in the future? Because I know, uh, you know, we already have the technology. There's a company called Big Brother. But they have cameras, CCTV cameras, and they can actually identify the customer by age, gender, and you know everything. But obviously, due to regulations, they can't they can't use all that information uh, because you cannot you know see if somebody is a woman or a man. You're not supposed to anyway, or the age group. So how do you think that's going to play towards the future? As you know, obviously these regulations are going to become stricter. Depends where you are. <laughs> um, if you're in Europe, you're going to be re pretty restricted. Um, I think, I think the general public is more accepting to being more, to, to releasing their data for an exchange. Basically what you're doing is you're being paid for your data. That's what loyalty really is, right? They're receiving data about you to help them try and sell to you. And in return, um, you're receiving a discount, right? Um, for, from their goods, right? So you're, you are being paid for your data. And that applies to Google as well, right? You, you get to use their search engine, they get to take your search history. So um, I think that the, the public is both is going two ways. One, one way it's going more aware, don't want to give my data out. And the other side, they're all starting to use loyalty apps, um, apps for your phones that, that bring on, you know, bring loyalty together like Yo-Yo Wallet, for example, um, is, is one we know. Um, and certainly, you know, that there's a get upside. It's a very interesting one in America that is soft, it's a bit of a startup, which is quite cool. Um, so there's lots of, lots of different ways. I, I think the, the consumer, typically I'd say most, I think most consumers will have some degree of loyalty across all the things they buy and sharing of data. So I, I don't think it's as bad. I would suggest that if you do want to take people's data in that way, you probably shouldn't call your company Big Brother. Um, that's, uh, that's one thing I'd say. Um, but, but yeah, I can, I can certainly see data just becoming more and more robust then into time and industry in the future. Yeah, uh, and you touch, on, you touch upon something really interesting, which is it will be the willingness of the customer to actually provide that data, which is through uh, mobile apps and all the kinds of loyalty programs, they will provide that data themselves. Uh, so we've got a few questions coming up. Uh, we've got one from uh, Thomas Midi, and um, they ask if you've already looked at electrical vehicle charging data at fuel retail spots from uh, as hedge petrol, or if you have any insights to provide on that. Yeah, so, I mean, look, electric is happening, right? It's, it's happening. It might not happen as quickly as everyone thinks it will, but it's happening. Um, you take the UK market, we have, I think, somewhere between 35 and 40 billion pounds a year in fuel duty. If we were to scrap, um, you know, the sales, totally the sales of diesel and unleaded cars, there's a big hole in government coffers, right? Which is going to be transferred to EV. Um, we believe, and again, you know, I'd, I'd be interested in anyone that wants to challenge this, um, that that's going to become commoditized and, you know, very similar to petrol. You want to fill up your car, there's going to be a cost to do that, and it's going to be a moving price and a competitive price. Um, so the answer is we, we're already looking at it. Um, we are... We, we, are we actually receiving it as Edge Petrol, receiving any data on EV? Not particularly, but it's definitely something that we're, we're looking at. I'm sure our colleagues are looking at, our peers are looking at in the market as well. Um, there is a lot of data on EV around, but it's still, Thomas, a very small kind of part of the market. Um, and most stations don't have an EV capability as it stands. Yeah. Uh, we've got another question, which uh, we actually, when you told me this example yesterday, I, I asked the same question, which is, um, how did they measure that uh, people driving diesel cars actually, um, you know, spent more in the shop. Uh, how how did they do it? Um, so it was literally a manual process for them. So they would like, I'm, I'm talking about, this is a single, so when we started out, right, two, two and a half years ago, I was driving up and down around the country, right? We just, we just launched, there was three or four, five people in the business. Um, and I was just driving around meeting retailers and I met one really interesting guy who took me through and he was super smart, right?
right? It was all done by hand, like everything, going through receipts, right? Writing the numbers down, right? Maybe a little bit of spreadsheet work, but it was very manual, that, that, that one. And that's given Edge Petrol the idea for, for you know, what we might do on dry stock in the future. Um, so it, it's, it opens up kind of exciting ways of looking at that, that data. Uh, and that's how we, we build everything. We just listen to retailers, we learn. Right? None of us have a fuel background. We've been in this for two or three years. We either come from upstream oil or power or another industry. And we, we, we've literally only picked up this knowledge from retailers. We built it with retailers. So um, we've got loads of examples of how people were doing things before Edge Petrol came along, especially single sites where there is no outside of Excel. There is actually no software that anyone's ever built for a single site station to use, right? Or, or usable software. So that was, yeah, that, that, does that answer that question? Ben? Uh, yeah, I think so. Um, uh, yeah, he says yes. Uh, so we've got another question. Um, saying if you've been monitoring not only on liter or diesel, but you know other other types of fuels that you sell or additives, such as kerosene or add blue. Um, and well, again, I guess what kind of data have you got from uh, studying those other um, those other types of liquids that you can find at petrol stations? Yeah, so this this is a little bit edge, edge petrol specific, um, but the answer is that we, we are receiving and ingesting that data and information, um, but obviously it's, it's less volatile. And one of Edge Petrol's USPs is the blended cost of product in the tank, right? Because so we're, we're connected in live, live to the cost prices and live to the, um, to the tank monitors and, and the pods. So um, AdBlue, you know, the price doesn't move as much. You won't turn over deliveries as quickly. But because we're seeing it still go through the pause, you know, we are also able to receive and look at that information. So how much we will do on that in the future? Um, will we make it into a grade like we have for unleaded and diesel? Probably not. Are we able still to share that information via some of our analytics tools of how AdBlue looks? Yeah, the answer is, is obviously yes, because we do, we do bring that data in-house. Uh, okay, Mark, do you want to give any final thoughts before I um, give a little send-off to the uh, webinar? Um, yeah, I guess it's, it's kind of what's on, what's on the screen at the moment. Um, you know, we, the, the market has changed, right? We're, we're, retailers are still trying to do the same thing. Um, but, you know, it it's amazes me how some people still don't use a tool of some sort, right? I, I find that, that really fascinating. Um, so that, that's uh, one thing you've got to change with it. Data is the most valuable commodity in the world. If you're not using it to the best of your ability, um, this is what the quote says next somebody is right you're wasting that opportunity to make more money for your sites and um someone's the reason this is in quote marks is one of our us partners said this to us about um pushing edge petrol out to his his customers and saying you know i'm going to say to them you, you might not see value in this data but your competitors do and they will right don't let them put you at disadvantage because you're using excel and they're using software right or well, i know excel is software but you see my point um and I think that the best thing here is which of these four players are you or, or your, you know, make up your own. Obviously, we've, we've, we've made those up um, and just find that tool that, that allows you to play the game that you want to play in the best way. Right. Um, if you're a volume business and you think that's that's all you can be, we'll go out there and make sure you know what your volumes are. Make sure you know what your competitive pricing is. If you're a margin business, know your cost prices. Right. Um, make sure that you're, you're blending that fuel. You're not just looking at the last delivery or not looking at the replacement costs. Um, if you're, you know, if you're trying to do everything, you know, maybe you maybe need more than one tool, right? Um, but the, I, I'm pretty certain that if you look across us and any of our competitors, every single person that uses them sees an ROI. I'd be very surprised to hear that they don't. So um, I think we're in that age now where, you know, there's so many people using tools. If you don't, you're, you're just at a disadvantage. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. Um... I really want to thank uh, Hedge Petrol for coming with this uh, idea. It's the first webinar we ever do at Petrol Plaza. Uh, I think it's a great idea. For people watching, they can leave in the comments any ideas that they would like to see discussed in future webinars. In the next occasions, we'll like to include um, different companies to have uh, different voices, which I think we'll all appreciate. I would only um, improve the, uh, the level of discussion. Um, thank you again, Mark and Nico. Uh, you've been great. And um, hopefully we'll see you uh, next time. Great. Thanks, everyone. And, and thanks, Oscar. Thanks, guys. Thank you very much, guys. Bye-bye.